Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and give a quick shout out to my new patrons, Sophia, Cassandra, Danny, Justin, and Marie. I just wanted to thank you guys so freaking much for your support. I know it's been a really crazy a couple of months and all of us have been affected. There's been a lot of uncertainty and I haven't really talked about it on my channel because I kind of just wanted to act like things are normal and just go on with my videos so that, you know, it's sort of a distraction from what's been going on. But I know that a lot of people were affected and I just wanted to thank you guys so much for continuing to support me and all my patrons. Thank you guys so much for continuing to support me even with all of the crazy stuff that's happened, I literally cannot thank you guys enough. You have been the reason that I've been able to stay afloat during all of this and up until now. So again, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you so much more than you will ever know and more than I can ever express. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your support. So with that being said, let's just get right into today's case. So today's case is quite the wild ride and the way that everything went down is incredibly frustrating just like in a lot of these cases and I know that you guys will probably be very frustrated with how all of this has turned out. There's a lot of unexpected turns in this case that really surprised me as I was looking into it. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think. But with that being said, let's just get right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Colleen Wood. Colleen Wood was 51 years old when she went missing in December of 2000. Now, Colleen was a divorced mother of two boys who was basically all on her own with raising her boys. She was described as being fun-loving and energetic, and she always had some sort of activity set up for the boys, and they were constantly up and moving and doing fun and new things. In 1998, Colleen's son, Todd, was sent off abroad to go fight in the military, and her other son, Michael, was married and had two beautiful daughters of his own. Also that year, in 1998, Colleen had lost her job of over 20 years at the local hospital in Akron, Ohio after the town had hit hard times and the hospital had laid off a bunch of different people. She had also been married to another man at some point, but that relationship didn't really work out either. So at this point in her life, she didn't really have any deep connection to her hometown of Akron anymore. Her sons were off doing their own things and they had their own lives and any relationship that she did have with other men was pretty much going downhill and she no longer had her job. She finally had this opportunity to go out and live her dream. She had always wanted to just get out and move down to Florida. Her son recalls that throughout their lives, Colleen had always mentioned how she wanted to go down south and live on a yacht and explore the ocean. She never thought that she'd actually be able to, but now she didn't have anything holding her back from just going out and doing it. She loved boating and going out on the sea, so she started looking around for some boating jobs down in Florida and eventually landed a job as an office manager at a marina down in Fort Lauderdale. She made her way south and began her journey into this brand new life that she had always dreamed of. She started this new job and was immediately loved by everyone that she worked with. She quickly earned the nickname of Marina Mom because that's basically what she was. She would go around and check on everyone and make sure that everyone had what they needed and that they were happy and content. She was just so sweet and kind to everyone around her that she made friends incredibly quickly with everyone that she worked with. I just want to take a second to say how incredible I actually think this is. She was in her 50s and she just got up and started this new life on her own and that's definitely not an easy thing to do. That just shows that she had a lot of courage and she had this immense love for life that she followed her dreams and she just did what she always wanted to do and wasn't going to let anyone stop her. So Colleen had purchased a condo in Boca Raton, Florida and just lived her life. According to her friends, finding a romantic partner 
was not really something that Colleen was interested in in her first year living there. She just wanted to go around, get to know everyone, and get to know the area and make friends. You know, she thought if a relationship was going to find her way into her life, then she wouldn't hate it. She wouldn't, you know, resist it but she was not actively searching for anything. This was until November of 1999 when she saw an ad in the newspaper from a man looking for a sailing companion. She had always just wanted to go off and cruise and live on a yacht and spend her time sailing and exploring. So of course this ad immediately piqued her interest, so she responded to it. She soon met a man named John Paul an attractive European man who immigrated to the US from the Netherlands when he was 15 and had just a bit of an accent. He was a successful Harvard graduate and was a champion race car driver and worked as a fund manager on Wall Street in the 1960s and had made a ton of money. He immediately swept Colleen off her feet and she was absolutely infatuated with him. He was perfect. He was living the life that she had always dreamed of, sailing across the sea on his sailboat, seeing new things, going on adventures. Not only did he have a lot of money, but he was the perfect gentleman. He started sending flowers to her work. He bought her these expensive and fancy diamond bracelets. She fell for him so hard and was just so happy to be with this sweet, kind, amazing man after she had been through two rough marriages and divorces. This seemed to be the type of man that she had always dreamed of. She told her son Michael about this new man in her life and he was so happy for her. However, soon into the relationship, Michael became worried because his mother told him that she basically planned to sell her condo, sell everything that she owned, including a bunch of her clothes, her car, and everything else inside of her condo so that she could live full-time with John on his boat and sail the sea. He was understandably worried and said that she doesn't need to sell everything to go ahead and live with John. He said that she should at least keep her condo, that way she would have somewhere to go back to when she was on land something that was hers, something that she didn't share with John. She didn't need to liquidate her entire life so that all she ended up with was John. He basically said that if John had all of this money, that he should be able to pay for everything while she got to keep her condo, but she disagreed. She said that it would just be a waste of money to pay for her condo that she wasn't going to be living in. Yes, John had a lot of money, but there was no point into having this condo when she was going to be living full-time on the boat. So she started the process of getting rid of everything so that she could start her new voyage in just a few months. So by August of 2000, Michael and Colleen's longtime friend Beverly finally met the man that she had been involved with for months. Michael thought that he was nice, but wasn't too sure about him. He thought that it was strange that John seemed to be pretty much always drinking, but he never noticed him getting intoxicated or being affected by the alcohol whatsoever. All that said to Michael was that John was quite the drinker. He was also worried about how John was going to be able to handle taking his boat out on the open waters and sailing for so long and keeping everything safe. Beverly also had her concerns. She was well aware of the implications that this trip had. He would have her all alone on the open waters. The only thing that they had was going to be each other. They only had each other and this boat and there would be no one else around or nowhere else to turn if something were to go wrong. She told John, you know, you better take care of my friend. And he gave her this wide, convincing grin and promised her that he would. So shortly before they set sail, she quit her job at the marina so that she could live full time on the boat. They weren't going anywhere yet, but as you can imagine, they had to get a lot of things done around the boat so that they could be prepared for when they were going to set sail. 
John had basically hired Colleen to work full-time on the boat to help him fix things and just get the interior ready for when they were going to set sail. She didn't need her full-time job at this point because he was paying her for all the work that she was doing on the boat. Now, as you can imagine, and as you were probably expecting, the relationship was not all butterflies and rainbows like it seemed to the people on the outside. John actually had quite the temper and it really got out of control especially when he was drinking. The temper was a lot more noticeable by Colleen since they were now pretty much living and working together 24 7. It's obviously a lot easier to hide your temper and not really have any outbursts when you're just seeing someone on dates and then you know going home to your own respective homes and not spending all of your time together. Those at the marina started noticing his outbursts and witnessed all of these different times that he was verbally abusive towards Colleen. But Colleen was so drawn into everything that she seemed to be almost kind of oblivious to the fact that he was being abusive towards her. She had pretty much set up a swear jar so that every time John would get drunk and start yelling at her, he had to put $5 into the jar and of course the jar was completely full. So that's kind of shows how Colleen saw his outbursts and his anger. She didn't really take the abuse personally and just thought that it was a problem that they needed to work on together. And of course, these are high stress situations. They're working together. They're trying to get this boat ready. My dad has a boat. I know how stressful getting a boat together can be. I know how expensive it is. I know how it's a ton of work. So that makes sense why they would be fighting and you know i guess that's maybe how she saw it she didn't really see a red flag yet of a man who might have some underlying problems he was giving her everything she needed and she was living her dream they had these plans and there was nothing that was going to get in the way of them going and sailing across the ocean so on december 3rd 2000 Michael and Colleen had spoken on the phone for Colleen's birthday and she sounded upbeat and happy. She was excited to tell him that she had found the perfect gift for her granddaughters and that she would be sending them over soon. By the way, if you hear a lot of background noise, that is my dog playing with her toy. It's very um, loud, so I'm sure it might be a little bit distracting, so I apologize. But either way, during this conversation, she said that her and John were going to be taking a quick trip to Key West and that she was excited for that too. But the conversation seemed to take at least a little bit of a turn when she started telling him that she was going to be sending him over basically all of her personal belongings, like mementos, family pictures, financial documents, and things like that. She had gone ahead and basically made copies of all of her credit and debit cards. She made an Excel document of all of the PIN numbers and sent all of that information over to him. She probably just wanted to make sure that everything was in order for when they would be out of the country just in case anything were to happen. She then wrote him a letter kind of elaborating, saying that she was going to be going to Key West again over Christmas, and then she planned to go sail by Cuba after that. So she was going to be out on the open waters so she wouldn't have any cell service or any way to get into contact with them for a while. She said that she would be getting back in touch with them whenever she did come back, but to not expect to hear anything from her for a little bit. By December 15th, Colleen had spoken to a coworker on the phone telling her about how her and John had gone to Key West to sort of test everything out on the boat. This coworker then invited her to their annual Christmas party that was to be held on December 19th. Colleen sounded very excited and said that her and John would definitely be there. However, December 19th came and went and she did not show up for this Christmas party. Michael had also not received the gifts for his daughters that Colleen said she would be sending and she hadn't called them in quite a while and Christmas came and went without hearing from her. But at first, Todd and Michael weren't totally panicked because this did seem to fit her plans. She told them before that she wouldn't be contacting them for a while because of this trip and that she was going to be out by Cuba with no cell reception. But by mid-January, when they still hadn't heard from their mother, 
they really began to wonder if something horrible happened to their mother. So the two started calling around to anyone that they knew that had spoken to Colleen to see if anyone had seen her recently, but obviously no one had. He tried calling Colleen herself several times, but actually found out that her phone had been shut off by the cell phone company due to several missed payments. He didn't even have John's cell phone number, so he couldn't contact him. So at this point, he was at a total loss of what to do. So this is when Michael decided to go on Google and look up John Paul to see if he could find anything that could help him in their search. This is when they uncovered that John Paul actually had a very lengthy criminal past and when he realized that the man, that him and Colleen and everyone else thought they knew, was a complete fraud. Now I want to get into a little bit more into who John Paul really was. And let me tell you, it's wild. Now, John Paul was born in Holland and moved to the US and went to Harvard. All of that was true. When John was 19, he had a girlfriend at the time that was 16 and they conceived a son who they named John Paul Jr. John Paul Sr. and his girlfriend got married and stayed together for 10 years until they eventually divorced. At some point, John Paul Sr. did go to Wall Street and did make a lot of money. I'm not sure when this happened, but at some point, John Paul had two other children, a son and a daughter, as well as two other wives, both of which, of course, ended in divorce. The other son and daughter that John Paul had stayed with their mothers, but John Paul Jr. came and lived with his dad in Florida because it was warm and because he wanted to be a race car driver just like his dad, which also, that was true, he was a championship race car driver. John Paul Sr. was an IMSAGT champion and his son wanted to follow in his footsteps, which he did. John Paul Jr. went on to live an exciting and dangerous race car career, often crashing his car and injuring himself, but he did win a couple of IndyCar championship titles. But even throughout John Paul's race car career, he was known to have quite the temper. There was one instance where he approached another race car driver after a race that he did not like the outcome of, and he tried to punch this man so hard that he broke his own arm and was arrested for the assault. But this is not the only time that he got in trouble with the law. Now, in 1979, John Paul Jr. and another man were loading equipment onto a pickup truck off of a cargo ship in the Louisiana bayous in the middle of the night. Patrolman custom agents heard the commotion and came over to the truck to check things out and see what was going on. This is when they smelled marijuana coming from the truck. Police searched their boat and found marijuana residue and $10,000 in cash. They then searched the truck and found that at this time they had been transporting 1,565 pounds of marijuana. John Paul Jr. and Sr. were both arrested and charged. They both pled guilty for possession and received three years probation with a $32,000 fine. Well, turns out this was not the end of that. Another man who was working in John Paul's smuggling operation came forward to the FBI and agreed to testify against the Pauls in return for immunity. Turns out this entire marijuana smuggling operation included them trying to smuggle a total of 200,000 pounds of weed from Colombia into the US. Not only that, but they were involved with a lot of money laundering, of course, to explain how they were making all of this money from the 200,000 pounds of marijuana. Well, of course, John Paul Sr. found out about this man talking to the FBI, so he shot him three times. The man did survive and reported this to police, and then three months later, John Paul Sr. turned himself in to police. He pleaded guilty, spent 10 days in jail, and then was released on a $500,000 bond. He then failed to show up for his trial and was basically just living out free as a fugitive for a year until he was found and apprehended in Switzerland and then brought back to the US for trial. He then finally pled guilty to attempted murder, money laundering, and drug charges and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. His son, John Paul Jr., also received some jail time because he refused to testify against his father in trial. He received two years for that, which 
is just crazy to me how loyal he is to his father and then stuff that we found out later it just makes it kind of sad honestly but either way John Paul Sr. only served 13 years of his 25-year prison sentence and was paroled in July of 1999. After this, he met Colleen, and we know everything that happened since. So, like I said, Michael hopped on Google and immediately found all of this out. He saw the charge for the weed and the money laundering and the attempted murder. This sent him and his brother Todd into an absolute panic. They were kicking themselves for not finding all of this out sooner and letting their mother just go with this man, but he was such a smooth talker. He was so polite. He was so well put together that they just never thought to look into him before this. I also do want to say that this was the early 2000s and people just didn't google each other as much. I feel like even now people don't really google each other, they more so just look into their social media, but it definitely was not as common back then to search people online. So I know a lot of people are gonna say that, you know, they're dumb for not looking him up sooner, but obviously hindsight is 2020, and it just was not as common back then. And plus, with how he presented himself, they had no reason to suspect anything. But either way, after finding out about John's criminal past, he immediately called police to report Colleen missing. But this found to be incredibly difficult, as you can imagine. They had no address for her other than the mailing address that her and John had set up for when they came back to pick up their mail. They have no idea where she was last seen, so they didn't even know what agency to get on her case. They called the Akron police at first to see what they should do because they didn't really know where to start. Plus, it had been two months since Colleen was last seen, so any evidence or trace that they could have possibly found right away was probably long gone by the time that she was reported missing. By mid-April, Michael had figured out how to contact John Paul's daughter, Tanya, who lived in Indiana. She said that she also did not have any way to contact her father, but that he actually reached out to her every three weeks. But one thing that Tanya did tell Michael was that John had told her that Colleen and John had gotten into a fight on the boat about one of John's past girlfriends and that Colleen had just left and was no longer on the boat. Beyond that, she didn't really know any more information, so Michael just asked her that next time John Paul calls her to have him call him. So this is when he contacted the Fort Lauderdale police to file a missing persons report there. Now. Initially, they basically told him that there was no clear evidence of a crime being committed and that there was nothing that they could do, but eventually a detective actually did reach out to him and he stressed to this detective that there was absolutely no way that she would have just left off of this boat and then stayed off of the radar for four months, which is how long it had been at this point. So the detective finally started looking into John Paul's background and saw his extensive criminal history. So knowing all of this, police tried to track him down, but of course there was no trace of him or Colleen or their boat, the island girl. Michael finally received the phone call that he had been waiting for for months. John Paul finally reached out to Michael. So John basically told Michael about this entire fight that they had and said that Colleen had left the boat after the fight, but then she had come back a few days later to gather all of her belongings and left after telling him that she was finished with him and never wanted to see him again. Michael asked where he was and said that he was worried about Colleen, but John Paul literally just said that he's sailing in Europe and didn't seem concerned for Colleen's well-being whatsoever. But the thing is, at this point, police had been able to track down his boat to a dry dock in Key West. So clearly, John was not out sailing his boat in Europe because it was literally right in front of them in Florida. By April 30th, John finally came back to the US from wherever he was and police surprised him by meeting him at the dry dock. When police initially questioned him, he was very cooperative and seemed to be telling the same story that Michael had told them before, except this time he told police that the argument was actually about money, not about some ex-girlfriend. I guess he had paid off some of Colleen's credit card debt and said, 
that she promised to pay him back, but then she wasn't paying him back, so then he got angry, so he gave them the same story about her leaving the boat and then returned back a few days later, bringing two men with her and then grabbed all of her stuff and again said that she wanted nothing to do with him and that she was never going to be back. Now, police did not believe his story, but they didn't have anything to charge him with at the time, so they weren't able to detain him at that moment. But by leaving the country, he actually did violate his parole. So police were able to obtain a search warrant for the boat. But when police returned later to the dry dock, both John and the island girl were gone. The day that police had interviewed him, he took his boat and just sailed off. So it was clear that he wasn't actually sailing in Europe, but he probably knew that the walls were starting to close in. So he came back to get his boat and booked it out of there. Once again, he was nowhere to be found with no idea of where he had gone. This obviously looked pretty bad and solidified the assumption that Colleen was probably in grave danger. So police started interviewing and asking around and found out that her job had been getting all of these phone calls about unusual activity on her credit card. She had always had a pattern of usage that was pretty consistent until the 18th of December when that whole pattern completely changed. It had appeared as if she had went around to different areas of the city and taken out money from several different ATMs. Michael then flew down to Fort Lauderdale to look through this ATM footage with police to see if there was any way that this was Colleen taking the money out. But to his absolute dismay, it was not her. It was two different women at these ATMs who looked nothing like Colleen taking out money with her debit card with her PIN number. Police were able to track down these women who told them that a man had given them Colleen's card and her PIN number and asked them to go to these different ATMs to take out money. When they did so, they were allowed to keep 10% of what they took out while this man got the rest. Police then found out that in December, Michael had used Colleen's credit card to put out another ad in the newspaper asking for another partner to come out and sail with him, just like the one that he had originally used to draw in Colleen. This ad was put out while he was still with Colleen, and in this ad, he used the name George. They had also actually found out that the exact same amount of money that was removed from Colleen's account was the same money that she had received when she sold her condo. They had figured out that he managed pretty much all of her finances and that he played a huge role in convincing her to sell her condo and get rid of all of her belongings. He put immense pressure on her to do so. Also, remember what I mentioned earlier about her sending Michael? all of her bank information, all of her credit card numbers, all of her PIN numbers, and all of that. Well, all of this information was on her laptop, so Michael had access to her computer and he easily could have accessed all of this information and taken all of the money out. At this point, police were scrambling to contact several different federal agencies to flag his passport and contacted the federal guard to hopefully keep an eye out for his boat. They continued talking to people around the area to see if they could find out any more about the relationship, to see if they could get anything useful from that. They found out from the neighbors, like I mentioned earlier, that he would get into these explosive fits of rage and then he would yell at her. She was always a super sweet and easygoing woman, but her neighbors believed that in the months before they actually set out for their voyage, that she started to kind of realize what he was doing and started to have some doubts. Their arguments got increasingly more intense and she started to seem very reluctant about taking this big step. Obviously, she ended up going, but it just kind of shows that there were a lot of problems that were going on right before they left. So after all of this, they have yet to get a hold so after all of this, they have yet to get a hold of John Paul, which is absolutely just so frustrating. Like I said, investigators had called several agencies who were keeping an eye out for him, and over the years, 
they had actually spotted him several times. In 2004, he was spotted in Jamaica. A few years later, he was in Fiji. He was seen in several different spots in coastal Asia and Europe, but never in the US. Most recently, as far as I've heard, he was going island hopping in Indonesia since it's very easy to just get lost and stay lost there. None of the areas that he was spotted made it possible for federal authorities to legally do anything since this wasn't US territory and nowhere that he was spotted had treaties with the US for exportation into the US. If he had been spotted anywhere in the US, he would have been arrested because he does have an active warrant out for his arrest for breaking his parole. But since he never went to the US, no one can do a thing. He was listed as the main person of interest in this case, but obviously since they couldn't really do an investigation into his involvement, that's where it stayed. So that's pretty much where it's been left off since then. John Paul is now in his 70s, and as far as anyone knows, John Paul hasn't stepped foot into US territory since Colleen disappeared. John Paul Jr.'s mother passed away from Huntington's disease, and John Paul Jr. himself is now also battling the disease. He didn't even come back for the funeral for his ex-wife and hasn't spoken to his son as far as I've heard. So who knows if he even knows his son is battling Huntington's, which is such a debilitating disorder that it just enrages me that his son was so loyal to him, even accepting jail time to avoid talking against his father. And yet he can't even find it within him to visit his son, who is probably going to pass away within the next 10 to 15 years from Huntington's disease. I'm sorry, but that just really bothered me. Like I said earlier in my video, it bothers me that he was so loyal to him. And his dad, I mean, as far as we know, hasn't even bothered to visit him. I mean, he could have, and John Paul Jr. just doesn't want to give that away, but I don't know. I think that he's probably so afraid of getting caught that he probably didn't visit his son. So obviously we have one main theory in this case that John Paul is responsible for harming Colleen, but I feel like there's some different thoughts as to how it went down. So the first possibility is that John Paul wanted a lady to travel to seas with, that he met Colleen and he genuinely liked her. Maybe he genuinely wanted to travel with a beautiful, easygoing woman but then one day, as they were traveling, they got into a huge argument about something. So in a fit of rage, he hurt her. Maybe he killed her on accident or on purpose, but either way, since they were out on the open ocean, he probably just threw her overboard and cleaned up the evidence. The other possibility within this theory is that this was an entire money-making scheme from the very beginning. We don't know if John Paul had met maybe with other women before meeting with Colleen, so maybe he put this ad out in hopes of attracting a woman who would be easily convinced to getting rid of all of her assets so that he could run her dry. It's thought that after Colleen sold her condo that he took all of the money that she made from that and then hired Colleen to work for him on the boat like we mentioned earlier, but then that he was paying her all of her own money. Maybe his plan was to take all of her money and then leave her with nothing and then drop her off somewhere where she wouldn't be able to come home and report him. Maybe he really did drop her off somewhere like Cuba and left her with nothing, so she just hasn't been able to come back to the US. But I don't personally think that this is very likely, since she probably would have just gone to the police in whatever other country and found a way to get back to the US even with no money. Or maybe this whole scheme was to take all of her money and then leave her before she noticed Maybe he didn't even mean to harm her through all of this. He could have just wanted to take her money, leave her at the dock, and then ran away before she noticed. And then by the time that she reported it, he was long gone traveling the seas. Maybe she had figured out that he was taking her money long before. So she threatened to go to police, so he harmed her because of that. Or there could have just been some sort of argument about her accusing him of taking her money or something like that that resulted in him harming her. The last possibility is that maybe he put out this ad specifically to find a woman to harm and then steal her money. 
Maybe it was his plan from the very beginning to find a woman to harm and rob. He could have just wanted to get to know this woman first to make sure she had a lot of assets before going on and harming her and taking on that risk. The only thing that really gets me with this is that I feel like he probably wouldn't have gone and met her family and made his name and face known to everyone before doing so if it was his initial intention to just meet this woman and then just harm her. I feel like he didn't plan on wanting to run for the rest of his life because obviously if he had just put out this ad to go ahead and hurt the woman who responded, he probably would have used a fake name and he probably wouldn't have shown his face to all of the different people who would possibly know that he was involved. I don't know for sure if he really did just want to harm someone and then just be on the run for the rest of his life. He clearly knows what countries to go to knowing that he won't be exported back to the US, but I feel like knowing his history with his son at least he at least cared about him enough to want to stick around if he felt like he could. Him and his son did seem relatively close. I mean, they worked together. He stayed with him for a while after he got out of prison. So I feel like given what we know about him running, this probably was not something that he planned from the very beginning. I mean, who wants to run for their whole life and not want to see their family. In my opinion, I think that it probably was a money scheme from the very beginning. I don't think that he really wanted a lady to travel with. I mean, it's nice that he had one and maybe he, you know, saw that as sort of an extra benefit, but I think that he convinced her to get rid of everything so quickly with barely even knowing her. That's what makes me think that it was a money-making scheme from the very beginning because obviously they didn't even know each other very long before he got her to get rid of all of her stuff and took all of her money. I do think that he wanted something temporary. I think that he did enjoy having a woman around. No one enjoys being completely alone, but I do think that his plan was to suck her dry of all of her money, leave her with nothing, and then find the next woman to rob and do the same thing with. Again, we know that he put out another ad and then just leave her maybe on the dock and then not have her know where he went, and then by the time she reported it again, he would be nowhere to be found. I think she figured out what he was doing. They got into a big fight, so he harmed her out of rage. To me, that seems like the most likely theory given his actions after all of this went down. I just think it's so freaking sad to see this woman be so excited to finally start this next chapter in her life that she had always dreamed of. She thought that everything in her life was finally settling into place before a man selfishly took her life and stole her money. I can't even imagine the things that must have gone through her head before she died, and yes, it is assumed that she had passed away. My heart goes out to her and her kids and her grandkids. She seemed like such a wonderful, energetic, beautiful woman who just wanted to go on an adventure. It's just absolutely so heartbreaking to me. She trusted this man, she gave him everything, and he took everything away from her, including her life. So that is pretty much all I have for today's video, and now I want to know your guys' thoughts. Do you think that this was a planned attack from the very beginning? Do you think this was a fit of rage? Do you think anything else could have happened? Do you think maybe it was an accident? please let me know in the comments down below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram, both be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.